breaking and entering, drunk and disorderly, law and order. A former prosecutor and a defence lawyer, not your typical pairing. And the result? Conversations about crime and punishment that are guaranteed to get you thinking. Welcome to Justice Matters with Joe Crowley and Lizzie Green, a brand new weekly podcast. Our episodes are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. Check out our Instagram for clips at Justice Matters Pod. Enjoy the episode. This episode contains offences of violence, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, Lizzie. Hello, Joe. Lady in red. Yes, nice and bright today. It Isn't matches it? your tie. Thank you, it does. Yes. I know, we obviously worked that in well. Coordination. All right, so again, today I um, had a um, wanted to talk about something because I've been asked about it, which is about international criminal law. Ooh, mm. so my lack of knowledge about this will be very evident. I guess I'll have a lot of questions. Okay, that's good. Questions are good. I always uh, like questions. I don't profess to have a... I'd say I had a working knowledge of it, maybe. I did work for three months in the um, extraordinary chamber in the courts of Cambodia defending, or well, actually I was on the defence team. I was a junior, very junior member of a defence team for one of the um, Khmer Rouge. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, that is a lot more experience than I have. <laughs> so I have some knowledge of it, but I don't profess an expertise. And I do find people in this area who, who have an expertise in international law, international criminal law, they tend to be, you know, they tend to, you know, be very academic and they read everything and they are very particular particular about stuff so i'm definitely going to say something which is not a trait of yours it's not a trait of mine i'm a big picture guy we all know that um well but having said that look and i know it's not real life mm. but you successfully coached a number of teams to mm. win the international criminal court moot competition yes. which is no small feat thank you uh co-coached in co-coached. some cases mm. um yeah that was in the hague that was a lot of fun and i learned something about international criminal law there and international law generally there's a bit of a crossover it is quite a like it's such a big area of mm. law and it is like i i touch on it so minutely yeah. in my foundations course and i've been teaching that for 4 years and i yeah. still think i have not even scratched the surface so it mm. is a huge area of law massive area mm. now i'm sure people listening to this are going to be instantly thinking well uh we'll be talking about the israel gaza conflict which mm. is uh on at the moment and that is the impetus for the program in that the prosecutor from the International Criminal Court has just issued arrest warrants for the president, Benjamin Netanyahu, is he the prime minister or the president of Israel, another Israeli um, political leader, and then I think two or three of the Hamas terrorists. Um, and they, they, the warrants have been issued. And I think that's what prompted the person to ask me to if we'd do an episode to explain it. But I wasn't going to talk in any detail about Israel Gaza. I think it's such an incendiary topic at the moment, and it's a bit beyond my level of expertise because it, it's you know it's history, it's international criminal law, which I'm not an expert in. In it, you know, it's international politics and yeah. I think it's um, obviously something that people are thinking about and mm. and have a lot of feelings about. But I think you're right; it is such a a yeah. really difficult conversation mm. to have and mm. i think expertise is yeah the key with dealing yeah. with it in a way that gives justice to it yes yeah i mean i'm always a big believer in um in things being tried if they need to be tried in courts and so uh, sort of a trial by media i'm never a fan of so certainly a lot of the issues that are floating around about israel and Gaza may be i hope they are um uh if the matter is litigated you know, they those kind of things can be. Each side can argue their case, and and you know, we can hopefully get some kind of decision. Because there is also, and this is one of the things that confuses people, a case going on in the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, between South Africa and Israel about the Israeli Gaza conflict. So there's two pieces of litigation, or one's only just starting in the International Criminal Court and one in the International Court of Justice, about the same thing. And so I have had people not really understanding what, why, you know, how, what's the difference, why they're two. Well, and I guess, do you need to just flag briefly the difference between the ICC and the mm. ICJ? 
Yes. Yes. Okay. That's a, certainly a good place to start. So the international, that both of them are in The Hague. I've been to both of them on those um, moot to mooting team trips that you mentioned. Um, so the International Court of Justice, it's known as the UN Court. It's the court set up you know, by the United Nations where countries can go and thrash out disputes that they've got between each other. So it's a court where the litigants are countries, they're not individual people. Mm -hmm. And the um, law that is applied is the, um, the treaties of the United Nations. So um, South Africa has brought a case against Israel under the Geneva, uh, sorry, under the Genocide Convention. So after World War II, the UN, you know, and, and the Holocaust, the they created a Genocide Convention, uh, and it, that's a treaty, and countries signed up to it. And so South Africa signed up to it, Israel signed up to it. Um, I think the I think the argument again, I'm not an expert, that South Africa is arguing that. Israel is in breach of its treaty obligations under the Geneva Convention. So that's two countries fighting it out, and that's why they're in the ICJ. Okay. And I just think it's good to note, I mean, I I didn't know this beforehand, but, you know, we hear always about treaties and conventions yes. and that we're signatories, yes. we yes. being Australia, yes. signatories or um, – whatever, to these charters and treaties. And I guess not everybody even realises what that means or yeah. whether it has any real bearing. Yes. And and correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that we can be a signatory to all of these international treaties and charters and say that we agree with what they suggest, you know, like the yeah. rights for children mm. and all that sort of thing. Mm. But... As a country on our own, a sovereign country, we actually can do whatever we like and mm. we're not bound to observe those treaties or mm. charters. So how do they then bring it to court? Well, I mean, in that specific case, they bring it to court because, um, you know, the, the rules of the International Court of Justice and, uh, you know, allow them to. But what the outcome of that might be is, you know, it's it it has I'm not saying Israel will do this, but it's it has happened that the International Court of Justice has made a ruling, and the country against who the ruling is made has ignored that ruling. Mm. And, Was that the Palestine War? Uh, oh, I don't know. I'm not. Uh, I, I tried to find a case where Australia had ignored ignored the rulings of the International Court of Justice. I think we have. Certainly, the Americans have. Oh well, I don't know if it was the ICJ, but when we brought in our preventative detention mm. legislation, that was deemed to be. Uncons uh, it was oh, deemed against to be the invalid. Human rights, the Convention on Human Rights or something. Yes, to hold someone in custody after they'd finished serving their term yeah. of imprisonment. Yeah. And they said we were breaching our yeah. international obligations yeah. and we were like, thanks, but we don't care. Yeah, yeah. we're good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that kind of stuff happens more regularly than you might think. But that's probably this is probably a good place to, to start talking about what is international law? Oh, here we go. Um, and I used to, when I had to teach international criminal law, I would start by saying international law is not real law. And I think, I, th I, I still believe that to an extent. It might upset a few people. It may well. It's certainly all the people who are very earnest and study lots of international law will be like up in arms about it. But it doesn't operate at all like real law because it has no coercive ability or no clear path to coercion, perhaps I should say, because there is an ability to coerce a country to do something, mm. mostly through economic sanctions. It's the sort of the civilised way to do it, the uncivilised way is to invade them. But it, it's not a clear path to, to coercion. So let me give you an example. So in Australia, you know, there is some kind of incident that occurs that somebody complains to the police. The police investigate if the police decide that that there's been a crime committed, they will issue an arrest warrant and they will arrest a person and they will maybe keep that person in custody or not. Um, but certainly that person is required to turn up to court and the matter's heard it. The police pass it on to the prosecutors. The prosecutors run the case. The person can defend themselves. Now, if you are charged with an offence in Australia, you know, if somebody issues an arrest warrant, you can't go, well, I don't care. I'm just going to ignore that because the police will come and get you and forcibly take you to jail. Mm. Um, and you can't turn up to court and go, I'm not, I don't agree with the jurisdiction of this court. I mean, you can, and people have done it. And the court says, we don't care. And it just, it'll just roll on anyway. I actually just read a case like that. Did you? Where she was just telling the judge that there was no basis for any of the charge and yeah. it wasn't valid. Yeah. And the magistrate just ruled over her. Yeah. 
Mm. Well, you might you might have seen as a as a judge's associate those vexatious litigants who turn up in a in a debt case and say they didn't have to pay because you know they only had to pay in gold and the yes. Constitution of Australia. You know that crazy argument that was run for years. Love it. Um, Love it. You know, so that's this idea that you, you know you you sort of dispute the jurisdiction or something, and the courts don't. I mean, they will give a, a reasoned decision on whatever your yes. mad argument is, but then they just apply the law, and you know, even if it's a debt case, the, the court will make an order if you ignore that order. Eventually, the bailiffs of the court will turn up with the police and start taking your property and selling it to pay off to the get debt. the money. Yeah. And if it's a criminal case, they, lock you know, you up. they take you forcibly and lock you up. Yeah. So there's that coercive element. You can't ignore the um, the laws of the land. And I mean that applies in other countries. So if you go from here to the United States and you're having a holiday in the United States and you commit an offence over there. And they grab you and put you. You can't say, "Well, I'm an Australian. You know, you have no power over me." They absolutely have oh, power over you. Think of our Australians in Bali. Yeah, that's oh, right. Got heaps of examples. Yeah, who, who sit in jail over there? Yeah. Um, so, and and I mean that sort of in some senses is the, is the point. You're you're you have to abide by the law of whatever country you're in, primarily because they can coerce you to. Yes. They can force you to do it. How do you force a country to do something? You know, mm. so the, the it lacks coercive power, but it also lacks, in terms of international criminal law, a police force. So there's no international police force to do. You've got that right. look on your face. Are you going to say what about Interpol? Well, no. Well, you, you should have, because that's what I'd prepared my okay, answer. Okay. So to. what about Interpol? What about Interpol, Joe? I, I did query that. So Interpol is, if you look at their website, an intergovernmental organisation. And really, although it has its own staff and though they are often police officers seconded from different countries, really it just facilitates communication between the police departments of different countries. And so why is that not satisfactory? Well, because they don't. So an Interpol officer can't turn up in Australia and arrest me. They don't so have jurisdiction. So then what's the point of it? What they do, well, because it, it facilitates communication. So what they do is you commit a crime in the United States, you flee the United States and make it back to Australia. I mean, it, I'm not sure Interpol would have to be involved, but if they decided, you know, if they were involved, they would then issue a red notice to Australia asking for you to be arrested by the local police. So <laughs> my knowledge of this is limited That's all right. to a computer game i played when oh, i was fantastic. little yeah. called where in the world is carmen san diego oh okay have yes. you ever heard that i haven't heard of the game i know the cartoon oh my god i loved that game so much but you were the police officer oh. and you had to go and follow her clues to see which part of the world she'd oh. absconded to and then you could arrest her oh there you go so that obviously doesn't okay, so happen that absolutely does not happen oh, at disappointing all. yeah it was such a great game yeah so you do see in movies sometimes where particularly american movies where american sort of police are overseas yes. in like in Paris doing stuff. And I'm thinking oh, they have zero jurisdiction. I mean, the Mission Impossible ones are the most obvious. You know, these sort of CIA agents turn up in in Paris and set up roadblocks. And I'm thinking there you have zero jurisdiction to do this or to arrest people or do anything. So, so if they get permission from the local no, police? No, you're not going to. Was a, there was a big issue a few years ago where Australia sent police officers to Papua New Guinea to help the Papua New Guinean police. Yes. Well, they had no authority to... To, to do anything. Ah. So so Australia will send police officers to Solomon Islands particularly, but also to PNG. But what they are is they're like civilians that are um, that are there to, you know, consult. Do they get like deputised? No, they just no. sit in a, they well, they, I think they sit in the office and say, when you go out to arrest people, you should do it like this, you know, this is best practice. So they're not ah. there on the streets. Okay, no, I didn't know any of that. So, uh, sorry, in in Solomon Islands, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but there was some diff. There was a slight difference. It was a Ramsey force, and I think they did have through um, through treaties and through the Solomon Islands government passing legislation had some powers. But generally, you, generally, if you're a police officer, you, I mean, the, it's just the, your jurisdiction. Yeah, and I mean, they have this problem in uh, you know the ACT and Canberra. You know, the ACT police go across the border into into New South Wales. Sorry, I don't have jurisdiction to do anything. Similarly, that the Queensland crazy. police here who go south of the border, they don't have jurisdiction to do anything. Yeah. So that cross-jurisdictional stuff can be problematic and more what problematic about, across countries. Sorry, I know we're talking yeah. about international, but what about if you were a Queensland police officer doing a pursuit and they cross the border? You, you lose your jurisdiction at the border. Oh. What they do is they radio ahead and yes, they say, and say he's we're coming. coming to the border. Yeah. 
It's like Mad Ma- the original Mad Max movie. Do you remember that, Chase? It's fantastic. I don't know, with David Wood. So what happens in international criminal? There's no international police force. All right, so that is a problem. So what happens is there's an incident that occurs. A complaint is then made. Who do you complain to? There's no police. Mm-hmm. So you complain to the United Nations or you, I think maybe you can complain directly to the International Criminal Court because they have the office of the prosecutor there. Their office of the prosecutor acts differently from the prosecution service you work for because they both investigate and issue aware arrest warrants yes. as well as prosecute. Right. So multi talented. Multi. Well, see, I think there's problems <laughs> with that because you then, you know, you are too involved in. If you're both the investigator and the prosecutor, you then are way too involved in yeah. the case. You can lack. Oh, it's I mean, I'm oh, sorry. I don't think the actual person who prosecutes is the person who's no but is it that lack of or perception of not impartial well that's well that's my perception i'm not as a defense lawyer i'm not sure other people have complained about that too much right um Mm. so but but then again the 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 office of the prosecutor doesn't have it has staff but it can't send somebody to jerusalem to arrest benjamin netanyahu they have no jurisdiction to do no okay they have a jurisdiction to issue an arrest warrant and if Israel is a signatory to the ICC, the International Criminal Court, then they have a, a, a treaty tie to justify that. But in this case, Israel isn't right. a signatory to the International so Criminal Court. So that's another layer of complication. Yeah. So I should say this. So the ICC, the International Criminal Court, is established. It's, it's a court that you agree to be bound by. So Australia has signed the Rome Statute, mm-hmm. which is what it's called, and that means that we've agreed that we that our citizens uh, can be um, prosecuted under that statute by the International Criminal Court. Now, that's I might just pause there to say that's the big difference between the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, and the ICC. The ICJ, as I said, it is where countries litigate against each other. The ICC is about finding people mm. criminally responsible. And that's where it's the, the huge difference. So you can get a, a, a judgment, the ICJ, against you, but it's against your country. It's not against an individual person. Yes. And so it's been it you know, it's been felt well probably since World War One, definitely since World War Two, that, you know, people who commit crimes, war crimes or crimes against humanity, should them as individuals, not their country, should be prosecuted individually. Because that's what happened with the Nuremberg trials. That is what happened with the Nuremberg trials. So they they get to they, they did try to prosecute some more cr- people they said were war criminals after the end of World War One. So Kaiser Wilhelm, Wilhelm um, who was the, you know, whatever he was, the king or chancellor of Germany, the Kaiser, well, he was the Kaiser, sorry, of Germany, who <laughs> was felt responsible for starting World War One. They, the... Um, the um what was the versailles treaty i think they wanted to set up a court they wanted to prosecute him he was in the netherlands escaped to the holland to his um to his uh relatives who were the royal family there and they refused to extradite him so he lived in a house there for the rest of his life died i think in the 1930s doesn't really seem fair does it no so cut to the end of world war ii obviously it's been an even more horrific war Mm. than world war one and the Americans really want to try the Nazis and the Japanese and have people found criminally responsible mm. as individuals. Churchill's view was their soldiers, they expect if they lose, they'll die, just shoot them all. And I mean, they're, you know, I can understand that. He was a soldier himself. He'd fought in World War One, fought, fought at uh, Omdurman before that in the Boer War. So he had that soldier's mentality of, well, you're a soldier. You expect it's to be. That's what she signed up yeah, for. Yeah, if you get caught, you get shot. Um, Brutal. The Americans, um, Theodore Roosevelt, not Theodore Roosevelt, his um, cousin, the other Roosevelt. I can't remember what his first name was. President. It was President Roosevelt. Was it Franklin? <laughs> Franklin D. It was. You're very good. Franklin D. Roosevelt. He was all for, no, no, we've got to put them on trial. So they have the Nuremberg trials. Now, the Nuremberg trials, I think, were, were good in some senses and they demonstrated that, you know, victorious powers won't use, you know, they'll give people an opportunity to argue their case. 
Um, and there were some people, I think, that were found innocent in the Nuremberg trials. And they did the trials, the Tokyo trials um, for the Japanese um, hierarchy. Um, uh, but most people were found guilty and a lot of people were then executed. Some were given lengthy prison sentences. Yeah. that's uh, That was a tough one, like yeah. reading about all of that. Yes. Mm. The, the, but then nothing happened. So we the, the world lurched on for decades and then there was the breakup of Yugoslavia with uh, Bosnia and Serbia and the horrible conflict there, which occurs in the early 90s. Mm. And um, because I think, well, the argument is because it was on Europe's doorstep, Europe finally sat up and said, we need to do something, try and set up a permanent right. court. Unfortunately, it was too late to set up a permanent court at that point. So they set up an ad hoc court. So a court that just um, was created just to deal For with that, that purpose. Yeah. Um, the ICTY, International Criminal Court for the former Yugoslavia in The Hague. Yes. And they that's where they um, prosecuted Slobodan Milosevic um, and um, a number of other people who were um, who committed war crimes and so crimes against humanity. the people who work in the office of the prosecutor in yes. The Hague, yes. are they from all different nations? Correct, yes. So there's some Australians uh, working in that, but they are from all around. And interestingly, there's Americans, even though America is not a signatory to the Rome Statute. Ah, yeah, Russia, how does America, that work? China, and Israel. Well, I mean, they're, they're, these individuals are interested in international criminal law, and they have the required skill set, and so oh, they okay. can be employed. Um, I don't think the UN discriminates on where you're from, based, you know, yeah, in terms it's a of qualification. Yeah, yeah. So, but my experience has been that although America as a, the United States as a country hasn't signed up. Its citizens, its lawyers are very involved in international criminal law. Right. And the judges are taken, again, from all around the world, like they are with the ICJ. Mm. So in Australia, we have, you know, in the, the our appeal courts, you'll have three judges sitting or five judges sitting or sometimes seven judges sitting. So because they like to take a lot of judges from around the world, there's like 20 judges of the ICJ. And so they'll sit 15 judges um, and for so, one case. For one case. So I and their their main courtroom is the most magnificent courtroom you've ever seen. I would like to go one day. Yes. yes. Well, I've been there, and it is this enormous. It looks almost like a cathedral. You're standing in this enormous room, beautiful red carpet. The chairs that you sit in, even as a member of the public, are these beautiful high backed wooden chairs with mm. velvet. Seats and the yeah and the and the and the bar table where the lawyers sit is enormous. You could literally sit thirty people or more along it. It's enormous, and then the the dais, the bench where the, the is raised, but it's raised a lot higher than in a, in a you know in oh, Australian really? court you're sort of looking on a, a, a short angle. angle. Yeah, yeah, in this you are looking on a, a much greater oh, wow. angle. They're really looking down on you, and there's and it's enormous because they're sitting. 15 judges. Crazy. So you would certainly get an inflated view of your own importance if you're a judge in that court, I think. <laughs> um, it's a, and who um, appoints them? Well, uh, they're appointed by the United Nations, but I think countries nominate. And oh, I suspect, okay. I don't know, some earnest international lawyer will no doubt tell us, um, that you know there's a rotational system. So it's like, okay, we now need a judge from so Asia or we need a judge judges? from- Yeah, we've got one there right now, Professor Ch Hilary Charlesworth, who was- oh. From, yeah, the okay. um, ANU, Australian National Uni. Wow. She's a judge on that court. That's amazing. And I think she replaced an Australian, or there's certainly been a, 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 okay. an Australian before her. Yeah. Oh, that all sounds very fair. Yes. It's and we had a representative. I, I met the Australian judge who was on the ICTY, mm -hmm. Justice Parker, West Australian Supreme Court judge. Right. And then after retirement, he went and did a few years over there. Okay. So, so. The Office of the Prosecutor, it issues arrest warrants. It also investigates. Now, the problem that they often have in these cases is you, you know, the ICTY, the, the Yugoslavia Tribunal, that started before the war had finished so that they were trying to gather evidence from as a war zone. As it was all happening. Yeah, as it was happening. Mm. So that they often have to um, investigate in war zones and that can be difficult. Yeah, well, I was also going to say I yeah. think we should – probably recognise that the types of things that are investigated and then charged mm. are the worst of the worst. Yes. You know, it's stuff that as a prosecutor here in Queensland, I couldn't even 
imagine mm. having to deal with a lot of the time. Like yeah. that's how serious it all is. Oh, absolutely. Because you are prosecuting somebody for, for example, genocide. Yes. How is it that you're proving a genocide? You are finding mass graves. That's right. And you are exhuming bodies and you are working out whether they're men or women and you're working out how long they've been there, how they died. So all the things you would do in an ordinary case for one victim, yeah. you are doing for hundreds of victims. And even like, you know, when I read things about child soldiers mm. and all of that sort of thing, they're just... Like all crime is horrible, but these international crimes are just next level in mm. terms of impact and and horror, you know? Oh, absolutely. Mm. I mean, I, I'm i not good. I don't have, I've got a pretty weak stomach. I don't like photos. I don't like, you know, autopsy report. I like, I don't mind reading an autopsy report. I do not look at the photo photos. that I can avoid it. You know, and these are people who, uh, having to investigate, well, the, the actual prosecutors who are standing up in court, I suspect, are not investigating, but they've got people in their office who do, and then yes. they have to though, go through and look at the photos and yeah, sh it, like shocking in the true sense of it. It's yeah. really the worst. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. So um, you were talking about the Yugoslavian. Oh, I, I was just talking about the um, you know the Srebrenica massacre, which is one of the famous massacres where they prosecuted successfully for genocide. And, you know, that what a horrible massacre that was because often there's not a lot of witnesses because they're all dead. dead. And so that sort of – there is another aspect to these international criminal trials um, but in the International Criminal Court. They tend to be what I would call mega litigation. They, they're trials that run for years. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I think in part that's because they, they can be quite bureaucratic courts um, and they can have quite bureaucratic processes, but also it's because of the amount of um, information they've got to deal with. Because what they do is they don't prosecute, you know, the soldier on the ground who executes the people and into the mass grave. Okay. I mean, that person will be prosecuted, but they often try and push that off to the country itself to prosecute. So. Right. Um, after the after the ICTY, the International Criminal Court for Yugoslavia, finished, they then had another court set up in Bosnia, I think it was, to try those lower level people. Which how do they do that if they were acting on orders? Ah, the Milai massacre defence. Mm. So in the Vietnam War, American company comes across a the village of Milai. It's a guerrilla war. They're fighting the North Vietnamese. In guerrilla wars, it's hard, often hard to distinguish one of the combatants from one of the civilians because they're the same. Mm -hmm. And they go into the village. Um, they, uh, I mean, I think are probably tired and strung out and whatever. And anyway, a, a sort of a, a killing frenzy starts and they end up massacring people in the village. And, you know, it's a terrible war crime. Yes. It comes out and eventually after an enormous amount of pressure, they are tried by a military court in the United States. And one of their defences is, I was under orders. So the captain or whatever who's in charge of the company, he's obviously can't say I was under orders to because yeah. there wasn't an order to massacre anyone, everyone in the village. But the, the soldiers who are actually doing the On shooting the mm. were saying I, I was just acting under orders. And that defence has been that you, you can't argue that because the idea is that you shouldn't um, follow it yeah in you, you should, order correct you you should and there were there were people in that company who were saying no don't do this and so well you know what that reminds me of what um a few good men oh yes with general coffee yes who was jack nicholson yes and he had ordered yeah the uh the, the, code, the code red red and so those young soldiers said they had no choice but to comply follow the order but they were convicted were they? Well, oh, they, they were convicted. Yeah. No, you're right. At the they end, they were convicted. convicted. At the end. Oh, yeah. sorry, spoiler. Spo <laughs> it's a 30 year old movie. I think if people haven't seen it by now, I get surprised because I ask my students about this. Yes. Sometimes because I have a precedent case that had two offenders that I dealt with who reminded me of those two. Oh, really? Yeah. And 
people are like, figured, man, what? Well, I've like, never heard you of are it. missing out homework. Go I know. Watch it. Yes. Mm. Such a great film. Anyway, sorry. But so that's an interesting, I mean, that's a, a military court and that's trying, um, you know, the, the people from the US military in the US military court. And that is what they often do with those, these kind of war crimes. So that's what we're looking at doing in Australia with the military people where there's accusations in Afghanistan that they yes. engaged in war crimes. So that's, the, those people aren't going off to the Hague to be tried in no. international criminal court. They're being tried here in a, a military trial. Well, presumably, I don't think they've set it up yet. They're still investigating. Right. But the ICC is different in that it wants to, it says, prosecute those most responsible. I put that in air quotes for those watching on YouTube because what does that mean? Because, you know, mm. in some senses, the person most responsible is the person pulling Pull the, trigger. the trigger. But what they mean by the, the, the interpretation that's been given to that is the leaders and the generals. Right. Making so, the decisions. Making the decisions, mm. yes. So n it's not that the people lower down who actually commit the offences aren't prosecuted. They just don't tend to be prosecuted by the International Criminal Court. Right, although they could be. Oh, yeah, there's no prohibition on yeah, it. Yeah, okay. But the International Criminal Court is always like the UN, you know, I think looking at the dollars and these things. As I say, mega litigation yes. takes years um, and so they want to try and get, the big get their bang for their buck mm. by getting the big wigs. Mm. So... The, but the problem with getting the bigwigs is if you are prosecuting the general who is sitting in a town 50 miles away while they're committing a genocide, he's not there pulling the trigger. Yeah, how are they? You've got, to, you've got to link what's going on in that village back. Now, if you're like the Germans and you are very good record keepers, or sorry, I should, should say the Nazis, not the Germans, if you were like the Nazis and you're very good record keepers, that's easy because you've got the general signing the order, kill everybody in this village, signed by me on the date, and so that's easy to prove. You say, you know, that's your signature on that yes, order. Yes, you're responsible. You are then, yes, mm. we, we can then link you. But what if it isn't like that? What if it is the general picks a particular commander in the field who he knows is just a horrible butcher who will just kill everybody? And he puts that person in charge of a particular group so and then he sends that group in. It, but yes. not directing it. Correct. So they, you know, so that sometimes they have to prove the that the general intended it by what they did. Gosh, that's hard. Yes. Yeah. But also sometimes I mean they have to prove I mean they have to prove basic things like um, that people, uh, you know, were killed, you know, in a, as a result. Yeah. Mm. So one of the problems that I saw in the um, in Cambodia was they would find a mass grave and they would say, "Oh, their people killed by the Khmer Rouge." But it's like, well, the the Americans had done a phenomenal bonnet bombing campaign across Cambodia before the Khmer Rouge came to power. I P.S. I'm not trying to <laughs> excuse the Khmer Rouge's horrible regime, but. You know, how do Where's we know that proof? mass grave yeah. is not people killed in the bombing raid as opposed to people killed by the Khmer Rouge? And so sometimes that they do things. I mean, if you watch, you can watch a lot of these trials on YouTube and they are incredibly boring because often they have got like military requisition orders for bombs or guns or, and they're trying to prove that, well, you sent this amount of ammunition to this particular army group. Oh, right. You know, so, and that was because you wanted them to go and, you know, this. you sent yeah. gas to them because you wanted them to, you know, you sent cluster bombs to them. Wow. Okay. You know, yes. So that linking these things can often be um, incredibly tedious. Time, tedious and time mm. consuming. So these. But important. Oh, very important. Mm. Yeah. One of the other things that has come up is this idea of self defense as an international um, justification. So that t has been argued. I'm not sure it's been argued in the ICJ, but it's certainly been posited as a justification for countries invading. As in the countries claiming self-defense? Correct. So you will recall, no doubt, the invasion of Iraq back in whenever it was, 2002, 2001. Well, you said it with such confidence that I would recall it. And, of course, I recall it, but not with any degree <laughs> of detail. detail. Well, you might recall the weapons of mass destruction. Yes. Okay. So that was the justification given for invading. So invading another country is now actually a crime that the International Criminal Court can prosecute. It's called the crime of aggression. Yeah, that's that's been around for a little while, hasn't it? Uh, I think since 2012, yeah. 2010, 2012. So it wasn't actually around at the in 2000. In fact, the International Criminal Court didn't come online, I think, till 2003. Right. But you might recall George W. Bush 
talking about weapons of mass destruction, Tony Blair, for the British Prime Minister at the time, agreed with um, George W. Bush that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and uh, John Howard, the Australian Prime Minister, agreed as well. And so there was a, 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 a multinational force sent to Iraq to invade on the pretext of a preemptive strike. Preemptive strike, self defense. So, in ordinary domestic criminal law, you can do yep. a preemptive domestic um, strike, self defense. Yep. So, if you feel, we've talked about this on the podcast, if somebody looks like they're about to punch you, you don't have to wait for them to punch you to respond. You can get your punch in first and yes. still argue self defense. Yes. So, the, in, this is a sort of an international quibble, criminal law equivalent. Okay. So, did it work? Well, again, it's international. How do you prosecute the United States? You mm. take them to the ICJ and complain that they are in breach of a treaty and then... They say, whoops. They say, great. Well, the other thing about the ICJ is you can you don't have to... You can ignore their jurisdiction. Yes. So... You, yeah, this is... Yeah, which is what I think is hard to, to wrap your head around is that mm. we've got these bodies and these courts and all of that sort of thing... You know, I sometimes say, like, they don't have teeth. Like, they are like a big brother saying, well, this is how you should be acting. Yeah. But you can just ignore your big brother. Yeah. And and it happens. Yeah. But so then I guess my question is, okay, but so not everyone ignores it. And there are people who are brought to the courts and they're dealt with. And wasn't there a guy? So when you say people. Yeah, oh, yeah, you're talking about countries. Okay. Yes. But yes. I mean, but you, you're right in terms of the people themselves. They can coerce. Oh, so let me just finish the ICJ explanation. So, yes, you can. So the so South Africa, for example, files in the ICJ against Israel. So then Israel is then invited to participate. They actually said yes, and they turned up and and vigorously argued their point. And so they're going to defend that case. Mm -hmm. But it's not unheard of that a country will be invited to participate and say, yeah, we're not going. I mean, Russia does that. I think the Russia-Ukraine one, I think the Ukraine's filed and Russia's like, yeah, we're not turning up. And so they've just have, yeah, so they just have this case where there's only one party. And then it'll make some kind of really probably make a preliminary ruling because often don't like making final rulings if they can avoid it and say something about it. And and so some people say, well, what's the point of it? But then other people argue, well, it, it does help because it can focus international, um, you know, sort of attention uh, tension and will to do something mm. because what happens is they're then enforced through, you know, sanctions. So if, you know, if you then ignore the ICJ, that can then be a reason for a country to sanction you. Well, we're not going to now sell you this because you're in breach of your obligations. Yes. really practical consequences. Yes, but again, it's you know a country is only going to sanction one, another country if it's in the first country's interest. Of course. So of course. the countries are always acting in their own interest. So if their interests align with the ICJ's ruling, we're Great. all good. <laughs> so different from a anyway. But sorry, I was I was I was you you mentioned people being brought to the ICJ. Yes, and that's the idea of an arrest warrant. So it issues an arrest warrant, but it has no ability to actually go out and get people. Yes. It re requ requires countries to give those people up. Okay. So those people go and, the, you know, the, the local police in that country have to turn up, arrest them, and they get extradited to the court. And so Slobodan Milosevic, I don't know if you remember, he they were issued an arrest warrant. It was years before they caught him. Yeah. And he had to, in the end, he was living in hiding and they eventually found him. And they extradited him. Because that's all my heritage, actually, Yugoslavian and Hungarian. Really? Mm, my grandparents wow. escaped in World War Two and came to Australia. Wow. Mm. There you go. What's your maiden name? Collar with a K. Oh, yes, of course. Mm. So... It, it requires so the, the the ICC has in the last twelve months issued an arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin. Okay, so he if he leaves Russia and goes to a member country of the ICC, they are obliged to arrest him. He won't do that. No, of course he won't do that. But there has been examples of people with arrest warrant, active arrest warrants who go to other countries and they don't get arrested. So I think his name was al-Bashir from the Sudan. There was an arrest warrant issued for him. He went to South Africa, which is a member country of the ICC. They didn't arrest him. I think what happened is he landed and got to his hotel and they're like, 
there's an arrest warrant out for you. <laughs> we are going to arrest you wrong? really, really slowly. And Why? then he drove Why back to the airport. Why did they do that? Floor. Well, I mean, I, well, for international political reasons, I don't pretend to be an expert in international no. relations, but it had something to do with they're all on the continent of Africa and presumably you need to help Would keep your neighbours. trouble. Yes. Do we know what he did wrong? He was involved in the civil war in the Sudan. Um, oh, I think okay. child soldiers, some pretty oh, horrors. Okay. I think he's still at large. Wow. Yeah. Well, that was good of the... Uh... Just missed him. Oh, we just missed him. He just got on that plane before we could get here. See, that's what they said in Carmen San Diego all the time. Yeah, there you, you go. just missed it. <laughs> yes. Those well, locals not being there you go. helpful. Yes. Well, and so that's what it relies on. Yes. So the idea that I think that Vladimir Putin will ever actually be tried is... You know, zero. Um, Which is, you know, like I think of him in the same way that I think of Hitler. Wow. Okay. What do you mean, wow? How can you not oh, I don't draw think, comparisons? Well, I don't think the guy's particularly nice. I'm not sure. We, I mean, we don't know yet. Maybe it'll come out that he was responsible for an incredible mass slaughter of millions and millions of people. But um, Oh, well, okay. I'm not saying he's done the same crime mm. as Hitler. But oh, and now we're back to me wanting people to die. But, <laughs> um, but I wow. often think if someone had just got rid of Hitler, what would have potentially been different? Okay, mm. maybe we can do an episode on that. Well, and no, I think that would be disastrous. I, I, sorry, I've taken a long way to get around to just finishing off this idea of, of self-defence. Oh, yeah. So that was the justification for um, America, Australia, and the United States, and Great Britain going into into Iraq. Yes. That is the justification that Russia has used for going into Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Nobody's buying that. No. What I mean, were nobody... they defending themselves from? Yeah, from, well, there's a story going around which has been debunked that there was, um, again, a weapons of mass destruction, mm -hmm. that there was chemical weapons being developed in Ukraine. Nobody's buying it. No, they no, were never found it. or used no. or yeah. seized. Or... Yeah. No. No, but look, creative, creative approach yeah. by Russia there. Well, the the complaint has been that they just borrowed what the Americans did in the Iraq War. But that was borne out, wasn't it? No, there was no weapons of mass destruction. Oh, there Don't wasn't. You remember? remember, they looked and there was none. Oh. Turned out to be a complete furphy. Ah, oh, see, I didn't follow back then. Yeah, I was not interested yeah. in the news. It was about regime change. So, anyway, I suppose mm. I should wrap up okay. the history. So, the ICTY is created for Yugoslavia. It obviously does its job and finishes. Yep. They created a special one for the Rwanda genocide, the uh, yes. Hutus and the Tutsis, mm -hmm. just a horrific genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, the ICTR, that one was called. Yeah. Uh, and that one was in Arusha. So they put that one in country. So the, the oh, Yugoslavia okay. one was in The Hague. I mean, yeah. that's reasonably close to Yugoslavia. They put the ICTR in Arusha in Tanzania, close to the uh, – they ran the Sierra Leone Tribunal yeah. um, and – then, but this was all moving towards creating an international criminal court. Yes, okay. Which they they have the Rome Convention in the late nineties, where they thrash out a treaty called the Rome Statute, which is an international criminal code. Yeah. And then they have to wait till a certain number of states sign signatories. it. Signatories. Yes. Yeah. That occurs in by two thousand and three. I think it then becomes a court. Right. But it's only got four charges that it can charge people for. Crimes against humanity, war crimes, crime of aggression, genocide. Hmm. Interestingly, piracy is not there because piracy is the original international, international. crime. Yeah. It, You're talking like old school piracy on the high seas. Sorry, yeah, not, not yes. computer piracy. Yes. yes. Old school, yeah. A horror. A horror. Captain Jack Sparrow kind of piracy. Yes. Because so the idea was that you couldn't prosecute um, you know, if, if if I commit a murder in Australia and I go to America, they can't try me for murder there. They have to send me back to yes. Australia to be tried here. Piracy was always, for hundreds of years, if you caught a pirate, you could try them in your country for piracy no matter where they'd committed that piracy offence uh -huh. because it was often committed on the high seas, the high seas. and blah, blah, blah. And so it's the original international crime. Uh -huh. And so I was like, oh, they should have had it because what they have to do to prosecute the Somali pirates and this kind of stuff is they have set up a separate court. Ah, oh, to deal with it. In the Seychelles. I'd love to get a gig there. Mm. Um, if any pirates are listening, who need defending? 
Oh, oh. God, Joe. <laughs> I'll have any gutters say she doesn't defend you. It's not the purpose of this um, episode. It might be a Pimp byproduct. yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> might be a, a useful side hustle. Um, <laughs> so anyway, they only you can only prosecute for four things. So, but within those charges, within crimes against humanity, within there are war crimes, there is murder, yes. rape, you know. But then torture. there's all these torture. There's lots of other ones you wouldn't expect. Forcible movement of population. So it's it is an international crime to force a population to move from one place to the other. Yes. Well, I judged one of the ICC moots, and that was one mm. of the. Yeah. Allegations. Yeah. I didn't know what I was talking no. about, but I asked some great mm. questions. I'm sure you would have very incisive. Mm. <laughs> so that, you know, that's a, uh, an interesting one because forcible movement of the populations is a, I mean, this is the interesting thing about the international criminal Well, court, I mean, is, couldn't it also be called displacement? You know, like it's, like forcible movement doesn't sound as bad as the impact of it. Yeah. You know, the consequence of yeah. forcible movement. Yeah. Is that you're displaced, you've lost your country or your home or your whatever. Yes. And you have to move. So when you when you rephrase it, I think you yeah. can understand it is actually quite a a big deal. Mm. Mm. That, that was the charge that we were dealing. Well, one of the charges we were dealing with in the in Cambodia because the Khmer Rouge came into the capital Phnom Penh in April of 1975, and they immediately evacuated the entire population and sent them out into the countryside. Is that sort of happening in the Ukraine as well? Oh, I don't. I hadn't heard. Oh, sorry. I think there has been some charge. Oh, yeah. So Russia, Vladimir Putin has been. The arrest warrant was issued because he forcibly removed children. I think. Yeah, I, th- I mean, I look. I I find it all really tough to to look at. I feel so lucky that I'm in Australia. Oh yeah. But um, I think there was a lot of people who were were displaced at least. Yeah. I don't know if it counts as forcible movement. Yeah. One of the other things I wanted to talk about briefly was genocide Mm. because I think genocide is overcharged in that they charge it a lot. In fact, that seems to be their go-to charge. It's always genocide, 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 genocide. Genocide is a very, I think, hard charge to prove because the core of it is an intention to kill or uh, in whole or in part a, a defined group, a race or religious group or... You know, and we've talked so much in this podcast about the difficulty of an, in, uh, an intention to kill mm. just in a one-on-one homicide. So, so getting the evidence to prove an intention to kill, a, a, you know, a race of people. I mean, in some sense, the problem is the archetype is the Holocaust, where the intention to kill is obvious. Adolf Hitler writes about it in Mein Kampf. Yeah. The final solution is well documented. Yeah. They were 100% trying to kill the Jewish people. Yes. Well documented. That is the gold standard, if I can use that terrible phrase for such a horrible incident. Well, the, but the best evidence of. The best evidence. So the other genocides haven't been like that. I mean, they've been obvious to some extent in Srebrenica. They go in and they say women and children leave, all men stay here, and then they kill all the men. You know, so, you know, but even then, you know, you could say, well. What? Well, they're only killing the men. Why don't they kill the women and children if they're trying to kill the whole race? But, but, so I mean, does it not count like if you were trying to wipe out a gender? Well, it might if you if you said we're killing all the men so that they, they can't procreate. procreate. Um, so tell me just one example you know of where the charge failed and why? Oh, I, 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 <laughs> like what kind of conduct has been charged as genocide but hasn't worked well, as well, a charge? Well, this is the other problem. I mean, the conduct's often charged because there's a mass killing. Yeah, so. But but my point is it's not, you know, charge them with, with you know, uh, you know a crime against humanity for the mass killing. Don't add, add to the prosecution's burden by charging genocide, which adds that extra level then of trying to, you know, the, show the intent. Yes. Yeah, I don't know though. Mass killing. So they. So this was the issue they had in the um, in the um, courts of Cambodia. The uh, Khmer Rouge were charged with genocide for killing the Cham. 
The Cham are really interesting people. I've, I've done a little search on them. I, I would love to do more. They were a sea people, you know, my love of boats. And they've been around for thousands of years and they sort of had settled in a number of the seaports around the um, Indian Ocean and I think into the into Asia. And at some point they had picked up the Islamic religion, so they were Islamic. So they were living, they were these boat people living in, um, you know, the floating villages, I think, on the Mekong River. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were Islamic in a country that's not an Islamic country. So that the Khmer Rouge, well, sorry, and this was the issue. The Khmer Rouge killed anybody who opposed them and they were incredibly paranoid and they just thought everyone worked for the CIA. So the Cham in some senses were uh, were different. They were different from the ordinary population. They were Islamic and they opposed the Khmer Rouge. So the Khmer Rouge wiped them all out. Yeah. But, you know, the question then isn't, well, you know, you know, in some sense, the defense to that is, well, it's not genocide. We wiped them out because they opposed us. We didn't wipe them out because they were champ. We didn't care who they were. Right. And and that, if you think about it, that is the most ridiculous defense to argue, but it's available because you've charged with genocide. Yeah, that's Like just right. charge them with a mass killing. But so if they're not found guilty of genocide, is that a... Is that is there a lesser charge yes. of mass killing? Oh, I don't know. Again, I'm not an expert enough to know no. if there's sort of an you alternative. You would think so. Like yeah. if you can't prove intent to kill, yeah. you can have a lesser charge of yeah. manslaughter. Or intent to kill the exterminate the race effectively. You yeah, can, so you, you just get them on a mass killing. The intent to yeah. kill all the people. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting though, isn't it? That it's so often charged. Yes. And, and I, I talk about the Al Capone uh, the Al Capone effect. And that, you know, so Al Capone is in the prohibition years in America, the gangster who is in Chicago and he's running, you know, the, the mob or whatever, the mafia, whatever they were. And everybody knew what he was doing, but they, they found it hard to build a case against him because the pe- witnesses would die and, you know, <laughs> people didn't want to give evidence and all of those reasons. So strange. Yeah. So what they did is they eventually got him on tax evasion. Yes. Okay, the, the movie Untouchables, we were talking about old movies. What a classic film. Yeah. I encourage everyone to see it. So <laughs> he, you know, so they, they um, if the movie's to be believed, they find his accountant and they get the books and to, they show all the money he's making and they show he didn't pay tax. And so he gets convicted of tax evasion, goes to jail for 11 years. And that, you know, and, and I think that's a great result because it got him off the streets. If the idea is that we want to stop Al Capone, we want to get him off the streets, Charge him with whatever the most obvious, most easy to prove charges yes. and get him off the streets. Yeah. So if you want to stop Al Bashir recruiting child soldiers, pick the charge that's easiest to prove, charge him with that, get him convicted. I guess I guess the only drawback with that is that the victims of the other crimes yes. are left possibly feeling a sense sure. of injustice. Sure. And so I guess you just have to weigh that up. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So I don't know what, where, you know, what, I mean, I, I, I hope that that little um, monologue has given people a, a bit of an understanding about why is it, oh, it's probably, I suppose the other question people ask is how is it the, that the South Africa, uh, what have they got, why have they got an interest in what Israel's doing? And the answer to that is, you know, anybody, anybody who's a member of the United Nations can complain an about interest. another country who's a United Nations about them not obeying their treaty obligations. Yeah, I think, look, I think that current affairs are probably getting a lot of people thinking and asking questions. Mm. And so I guess knowing even some basics about Mm. how those international legalities work and who's got rights to do what and who doesn't maybe can help understand why it's not resolved easily or quickly or Mm. with external pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's it's so difficult to to do, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't. As I say, the people who've got arrest warrants issued against them have got to be have either voluntarily got to give themselves up, mm. and there was a case where a bloke did that, or they've got to um, be handed over by the country that they're that they're from, or if they travel to another country and get arrested. Yeah, it's it is oh, such a huge area, so interesting, but also so. Mm tricky to come to grips with it all yeah so i think you did a good job oh lovely i feel more intelligent than i did at the start (laughs) fantastic (laughs) lovely thanks joe thanks lizzie Bye. bye thanks for tuning into this episode you can find links to the cases that we discussed in the description 
You can also find a link to Guardian Criminal Law and a big shout out to them for making this podcast possible. The majority of criminal cases involve people, normal people, people like you, people like me, who find themselves in an unusual set of circumstances that would not usually occur in their life. My name's Mark Savick and I'm here to assist you with your criminal matter. I look forward to hearing from you and being of assistance to you. If you're interested in clips, you can look at them on Instagram and TikTok. Just search for Justice Matters Pod. See you next episode.